Hey everybody, it's Derek Kumar from CodeOpinion.com. How do you handle processing a large payload? It could be that a user uploads a large image that you need to process, or even a large text file that you need to extract, transform, and load into your database. I'll explain how to offload work to another process using the claim check pattern and a message broker. If you're new to my channel, I post videos on software architecture and design. If you're into those topics, make sure to subscribe. If at any point you find this video helpful, make sure to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. So I mentioned using a message broker and here's why. If we have a browser that needs to upload and send our HTTP API a large file, let's say it's a large text file, when we send that to our HTTP API, if we're doing that within the process of that request, that means that we have to then iterate through, for example, this file, extract the data how we want it, and then insert it into our database. If it's a pretty large file, this could actually take quite a long time if there's a lot going on, which means that our browser and our user are then blocked at that point from once they uh, uploaded the file. So instead, what I'd rather do is have them upload the file and then do that processing separately. So the way this would work with a message broker is we have our client, which is our browser, and it's ultimately still uploading that data and sending that data to our HTTP API. So I have producer and consumer here because in messaging, our producers are what are actually creating our messages and sending them to the message broker. And the consumers are the one that are getting those messages so they can process them. So our HTTP API is the producer. Once it gets the data from the upload, what it can then do is create the message and send that to the message broker. And that message in this example right now uh, contains all that data from the upload. So at that point, we can return back to our client saying, okay, we uh, haven't processed your file yet, but we've accepted it. So we have that message in our message broker, and then separately, we can have our consumer consume that message and process it completely asynchronously. So there's one major concern with this example, is that I mentioned these are large payloads. That means if you're taking that large upload and its contents and putting in a message, that means that you're gonna have really large messages. There's three reasons why this can be a problem. The first is your message broker may not even support the size of message that you're trying to uh, create and produce. The second is that large messages can have performance implications simply because you're pushing that much data to the broker. And depending on how many consumers you have for a message, specifically if it's something like events and you have subscriptions, you're pulling that much data from a message broker. The third is, that it may be the actual total volume size could be the limit. It's not necessarily the number of messages you have, but if you're producing large messages, you're gonna be limited on the number of messages that you can actually uh, produce and consume it at any given time. So how do we deal with this? So the claim check pattern is what we're gonna use. And it's really pretty straightforward when you think about it, is that our producer, instead of creating a really large message, instead what it's gonna do, it's gonna take that data and push it to some file or blob storage. Once we do that, we then have some identifier that we can then put within our message. So instead of putting the data in the message, we're gonna put some identifier, could be a URI, depending on what blob storage you're using, could be a file path. Again, it really depends where you're actually storing the file. And it's really just a pointer to where that file is. So inside of that message, we just have our normal data plus that pointer, that identifier. Then when our consumer um, processes that message, it could then reach out to that same blob storage to get the data using that pointer. So this allows us to keep our messages really small, which is what we want, and then put that payload, that file, in some shared blob storage. I say shared because our producer and consumer both need access to where that file is being persisted. So you could implement all this code yourself of uploading the file to blob storage, using the identifier, having your consumer then pull from blob storage. But if you're using a messaging library, check to see if this is supported. I'm gonna do a code example here of how it's pretty transparent if you're using end service bus. I also wanna say thank you to all the new members of my channel. I really appreciate it. They get access to all the source code that I show in any of my videos. If you're interested in joining, go to my channel, click the join button for more info. So in this code example, I'm using end service bus, but this is applicable in many different messaging libraries like mass transit and .NET also does this in a very transparent way. If you're not using .NET, again, check to see the messaging library you're using. If you're using one, see if this is something, the pattern that they support. So what I have here is, in this is a web app where you can upload an image for a product to kind of give the uh, catalog item a pro, uh, an image. So what I'm doing is I'm actually publishing a message, uh, an event called catalog item image updated. And the way end service bus, th bus does this is it has a property, a type that you can create called data bus property, where I'm giving it a byte array. 
And what that does is it, once it notices when you're publishing this message, that if it has one of those properties, by configuration of how I have end service bus configured, it will actually take that byte array and put it into blob storage. And then transparently, when I'm consuming that event, here's my consumer, it automatically fetches that byte array from blob storage based on the type that we know that we're consuming so that I can just immediately already have it. I don't have to write the code to uh, save to blob storage or to retrieve from blob storage. End service bus is doing it completely transparent to me purely based on using this data bus property. So I'll show you now, I'll actually run this and we can actually look in RabbitMQ, which I'm using, that it just kind of has a pointer to the actual file. The file contents aren't actually in the message. So let's give this a run. So I have the app running and I have Postman up. I'm just gonna send this base64 image that I have. So now I'm broken at the actual consumer. So I've actually already published the image and and service bus, when it published it, it actually did automatically save that image to uh, file storage or blob storage. And now in my consumer, I just immediately have access to that byte array. But if I go and look at the actual RabbitMQ uh, message here, this was my catalog item image updated. And if I actually look at the payload, you can see that it doesn't actually have the data, that base64 image. It has the catalog item ID that I had as a property. But that image property is now, it's just this pointer to where the actual image is, where the contents were. And then, like I said, end service bus just automatically looked at that property, figured out that's what it was, and then immediately retrieved the data for me. So I just have access it uh, directly in my code. I didn't have to write the code to persist it and retrieve the data. So if you have a large payload from a user that you need to process, move that work out asynchronously using a message broker, but use the claim check pattern. Having the producer and a consumer share some blob storage where the producer can save to blob storage and use an identifier in the message that your consumer can use to then retrieve from blob storage. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. If you have any thoughts or questions, make sure to leave a comment and subscribe for more videos on software architecture and design. Thanks.